good afternoon uh, we have gathered here for the seminar session organized by elf english literary forum and my duty here is to welcome each and every one to this gathering uh, first of all i would like to welcome hod of english department mr sayed abid kota i welcome you sir then we have a paper by dimitrina efedova a british researcher of bulgarian origin and her paper is based on the topic martin links muhammad his life based on early sources i hereby welcome you ma'am uh, then i would also like to welcome each and everyone who gathered here and all the dignitaries on and off the dais then now i invite shariga our secretary uh, to chair the event thank you Good afternoon all. We are here to have a presentation by Ms. Dimitrina Sidova about the book Muhammad: His Life Based on the Earlier Sources by Martin Lynx. Martin Lynx is a British author. He was born in England on 1909 and had travelled to Egypt in 1940. He is a great admirer of Shakespeare and a Shakespearean scholar. He had wrote many brilliant works. This is the most famous work of his. He has wrote works like The Secret of Shakespeare, his play seen in the light of sacred arts, The Quranic Art of Calligraphy and Illumination, 11th hour, Ancient Beliefs and Modern Superstition, Sufi Poems, a Medieval Anthology, and so on. Here, this book is a comprehensive biography of Prophet Muhammad, and here we have with us Miss Dimitrina Sidova to present about this book, to speak about this book. Now, she is an independent researcher on this field, and she is of Bulgarian origin. And I welcome you, ma'am, to present. Hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Dimi and uh, I'm here to talk about the book of Martin Lee. Um, I start in the name of Allah, the most compassionate, the most merciful. Alhamdulillah. And I ask Allah to make this talk beneficial for us all. Anything good that comes out of this um, talk um, is from Allah. And anything bad or incorrect is from my own self. So forgive me for any mistakes I make. Today, uh, I'll be talking about the life of Prophet Muhammad, based on what is considered to be the best biography of his in the English language. Muhammad, his life based on the earlier sources by Martin Lynx. Martin Lynx was born in England in the year of 1909 to a Protestant family. He was introduced to traveling at a young age, spending significant time in the United States. He was a student and graduate of the English language and later on of the Arabic one. In 1938, he discovered Islam and became a Muslim. He then studied in Cairo and learned Arabic. Therefore, he started teaching English in the University of Cairo. Later on in his life, Lings also wrote, worked at the British Museum and British Library. Amongst his other works, his most well-renowned one is Muhammad, his life based on the earliest sources. A claim for originality and authenticity, this book is considered to be the most comprehensive biography of the Prophet Muhammad in the English language. Lings builds the, the narrative depending on 8th and 9th century Arabic sources, which include the sayings of, of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and Quranic verses. All of the sources are listed at the back of the book, and uh, if any was it, anyone is interested at the end, I can list them for you. <clears throat> the language Lynx uses to engage uh, us is very impressive, and the book is almost written in a story mode, giving us, um, in, in a way, a story. It is very fascinating and very well written, in my opinion. As I speak about the Prophet and his life, I will follow the flow of the book itself and I will mention the things that I think are most beneficial for, for the readers and us also. 
Even though the whole book is in its content is worth mentioning, I hope I will mention some incidents in detail, as I think that, I will, uh, that will help us understand the life of the Prophet. So we start with Once Upon a Time, except the story that we'll be talking about and the characters in it are real. Uh, once upon a time there was a man who was born in the desert of the Arabian Peninsula in the city of Mecca and became in it an orphan as a child when his father died before he was born. And yet one of his companions said of him, I have not seen anyone smile more than him. He was the most forbearing of people, the most just and chaste of people. He was the most generous of people who never kept no money for himself. If he had anything left over, he would give it to the poor and he would not keep it overnight. He would also help his wives and he would mend his own sandals. He would cut the meat for them and he would be the best of men to them. He would help his family around the house with whenever and however he could. He was the most modest of people and would not look anyone straight in the eye. He would accept gifts even if it was a small cup of milk and reward a person for it. He never ate his fill of bread for three days in a row until he died. He was the most humble and quiet of people without being arrogant, the most eloquent in speech even though he could not neither re read or write. He did not worry about um, the worldly matters and he wore whatever he could find and was not concerned with prestige and wealth for his own self and the ummah, the nation of the Muslims. Yet he loved perfume and hated foul smells. He would sit down with the poor and offer them food and eat with them. He upheld the ties of kinship without favoring his relatives over those who were better than them and he did not treat anyone harshly. He accepted the excuses of those who apologized to him and he would joke but he only spoke the truth even when he was joking and he would smile without laughing out loud. He did not look down on any poor person because of his poverty and sickness, and he did not fear any king because of his power. If someone took him by the hand, he would not let go until the other person lets go first. And yet he was persecuted from his own city by his own family, and was many a times laughed at and, and really abused, both physically and orally. He was forbidden food and drink, and was drawn out of his hometown Mecca. Many of his companions were tortured to death and were disowned by their own families. All his children died in his lifetime except one of his daughters. Bounties were offered for his assassination, but he got through all of those difficulties with the help of Allah. He was, a, he was the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, the last of the messengers, given the task to convey the message of the oneness of God, love and fear of God, to spread justice among his people and all of the mankind. He was and still is the most influential man that ever set foot on the earth. The one Allah chose for this noble cause. He abolished castes based on skin color and wealth and established the law of Allah in a land filled with idol worship, injustice, mistreatment of women, killing of girls as they were born just because they were girls and all of the falsehood that involved the culture of the Arab. His message re reached Arabia and the rest of the world, with many people still follow him till today. So we start with his birth. He was born in the ear of the elephant, no, known as the ear of the elephant because of the attack that was made by an Abyssinian king to attack the Kaaba, the holy house. So he was born, and just before his birth, his father died. So leaving his mother alone. The miracles in the Prophet's life started even before his birth. His mother narrates, A light shone so bright that, her and that she could see the castles of Basra in Syria. And she heard a voice say to her, Thou earnest in thy womb, the Lord of his people, and when he is born say, I place him beneath the protection of the one from the evil of every envier then name him Muhammad, so it was. The Prophet's birth was both, both celebrated by his family in the whole of Quraysh, which was the tribe that the Prophet belonged to in Mecca. It was one of the most uh, 
popular and influential tribes in Arabia at the time. For a blessed and truly special boy entered the world at that time, which we'll discover later on in the story. It was a norm for the Arabs at the time to send their newborns to be nursed with a nomad family in the desert. It would give the child a healthier upbringing and the chance to learn good Arabic, as the Arabic of the nomads was considered purer and superior than the one in the city. So that same little boy who would, few, who would, uh, who would spend a few years of his life in the desert was nursed and looked after there, and he developed his character there. The moment he was brought out of the city and into the desert was a moment of celebration for the people there. The land that he was going to be in was barren, and the camels would not bring out any milk. And there was no vegetation. So the lady that took him in, which name, whose name was Halima, narrates to us, I carried him back to where our mount was stationed, and no sooner had I put him in my bosom than my breast overflowed with milk for him. He drank his fill, and with him, with him his foster brother drank likewise his fill. Then they both slept, and my husband went to that old she-camel of ours, and lo, her udders were full. He milled her and drank of her milk, and I drank with him until we could drink no more, and our hunger was satisfied. We spent the best night, and in the morning my husband said to me, By God, Halima, it is a blessed creature that thou hast really taken. She and her husband were indeed overflowed with joy, and so were their neighbors and the people around them. So as the little boy continued to grow and grew stronger, none of the other boys could match him in power and growth. One day, little Muhammad and his foster brother were playing in, with the lambs behind their house. His brother came running to Halima and her husband and said, That Quraysh brother of mine, talking about Muhammad, two men clothed in white have taken him and have laid him down and opened his breast, and they are sitting in, they are steering it with their hands. So they ran to him and they found him standing, but his face was very pale. He said to them, Two men clothed in white came to me and laid me down and opened my breast and searched for it I know, I know not what, yet no mark or cut was left on his small body. The prophet later on in his life described the same incident, saying, adding that his heart was taken out by those two men and it was split open and from it a black clot was, was taken out. His heart was then washed with a substance like snow. In fact, he continued, he continued that those men were in reality, not men, but angels. Scared and fearing that the little boy might be harmed, Halima and her husband took him back to Mecca to his mother, convey, conveying what had happened to him. His mother was overflowed with joy as she said that great things were in store for her little boy. She took him back to Mecca. So, and they lived happily in Mecca, winning the affection of their uncles and aunts, and also his grandfather. When he was six years old, his mother decided to take him to Medina to visit his kinsmen. However, not long after they had set out for Mecca, from Mecca, his mother got ill, and after some days she died, leaving Muhammad in the cave in the care of his grandfather. Some years passed, and he also died, leaving the young Muhammad alone again. And then he was taken into care by his uncle Abu Talib which he grew very fond of and used to treat him like his own son. The city of Mecca in which he grew was known for its caravans, merchandise, full of merchandise both to the south and the north of Arabia. But what the city was most known for was the fact that the first house of worship of God was built there. And so many pilgrims used to come early to give their sacrifices, and that brought a lot of wealth to the Quraysh. There were the Kaaba's caretakers, when uh, the time passed and the little boy became, became now 20 years of age, he was already known in Mecca amongst the people as the trustworthy because of his honesty in dealing with the people. When he was 25 years old, an elderly lady named Khadija, she, she was 15 years older than him, needed him and said word for him to come and to, with some mer merchandise to go to Syria, as she had already heard only good things about him. He agreed and set the journey accompanied by a young man sent by Khadija, 
When they were back, both he and Khadija were impressed by the honesty and fair dealing of Muhammad. The young man especially impressed by his noble character and the easiness of the journey with him. Muhammad at the time was, was of striking appearance, described as a man of medium stature, inclined to slimness, with a large head, broad shoulders, and the rest of his body perfectly proportioned. His hair and beard were thick and black. He had a noble breadth of a forehead and big eyes with exceptionally long eyelashes. Although he, let, he left his beard grow, he never left the hair of his moustache cover his upper lip. In addition to his natural beauty, there was a light on his face, and this light was especially apparent on his forehead and his eyes. Khadija had noticed all of those noble characteristics and qualities of the Prophet and was eager to marry him, but she was shy, so she appro approached a friend of her to approach him on her behalf. The Prophet was more than happy to marry her, and he could not believe that a person like Khadija, at the time she was a very successful woman in merchandise and trade. She could not, he could not believe that such a person would want to marry him, because he was not really rich. The Prophet was more than happy to marry her, even though she had been married two times before, and she was older than him, as we already mentioned. What kind of a man would think like that? Indeed, this was a noble, noble man. Unlike what the Western society calls him, a womanizer who is just marrying for lust, where in fact the Prophet did not marry another woman until Khadija had died, and he always spoke well of her to his other wives, sometimes even crying out of love for her. Indeed, he was a true woman's champion. Khadija bore him six children, two sons and four daughters. Muhammad was also known for his generosity. In one occasion, he took into his care one of his uncles, Abu Talib's youngest son, and had embraced him and raised him as his own son. That was all due to a drought which affected many families in Mecca at the time, including his uncles. The beginning of the revelation for the Prophet was that he used to have good dreams. He never saw a dream, but it came true. Then seclusion was made dear to him, and he used to go to a, to a cave called Hira, where he devoted himself in worship. He would do that for a number of nights, going back and forth, going to his family for provisions and coming back again. This went on until the truth came to him. And suddenly, whilst he was in the cave, the angel Gabriel came down to him and said to him, Read. The messenger of Allah said, But I cannot read. I am not a reader. The angel squeezed the prophet and released him, telling him again to read. The prophet's reply was the same. And this happened three times. And then the angel said, Read in the name of your Lord, who has created all that exists. He has created man from a clot. Read, and your Lord is the most generous, who has stored the, write the writing up by the pen. He has stored man that which he knew not. So it was, the first words of the Qur'an were revealed. The Prophet then went back to his home with his, to his home with his heart beating uh, wildly and said to his wife Khadija, cover me, cover me. He was covered till his fear went away. Then he said to Khadija, O oh Khadija, I fear for myself. Then he told her what had happened and she said, nay, be of good cheer, for by Allah, Allah will never disgrace you. You uphold the ties of kinship, speak truthfully, you help the poor and destitute, you serve your guests generously and assist those who are striking by calamity. Khadija took the Prophet to her cousin, Waraka, at the time a Christian, who used to write the gospel in Arabic. He was an old man, a blind man. They, they told the story to him and he said, this is Gabriel, the angel that came to him who came down to Musa also, Moses. Would that I were young, and I could live until the time when your people drive you out. The prophets were surprised and asked, would they really drive me out? And Waraka said, yes, never has there come a man with that which you have brought, but he was persecuted. If I should live to see that day, I will support you strongly. The reassurances of Khadija and Waraka were followed by a reassurance from heaven in the form of a second revelation. Wah, he relates himself. Whilst I was walking, I heard a voice from the sky. I looked up and saw the angel who had come up to me in Hira. 
He was sitting on a chair between the heavens and the earth. I felt scared of him, so I came home and said again, Cover me, cover me. So they did, and Allah revealed the words. O oh, you, covered in garments, arise and warn, and, and magnify your Lord, and purify your garments, and keep away from the idols. After that, the revelation started coming to the Prophet quite frequently. He has narrated himself that sometimes revelation would come to him like a reverberation of a bell, like the ringing of the bell. And sometimes the angels would take the form of a man and speak to him, and he would be aware of what he says to him. So it was, revelation had come to the Prophet, and this, and thus he started speaking about the angel and the revelation to those who, after his wife, were the nearest and dearest to him. As yet, he had no demands to make upon them, except that they should keep whatever he was saying in secret. One day, the angel Gabriel came to him again, striking the turf of a hillside, whereupon a spring of water gushed forth. Then he performed ablution, showing the prophet how to purify, him, purify himself for worship, for prayer, with the prophet following everything that he was doing. Then he showed him the postures and movements of the prayer with the repetitive, re, repetitive magnification that is the words Allahu Akbar, meaning Allah is the greatest. And the final greeting, Assalamu Alaikum. Again, the Prophet following his, his example as the angel left him and the Prophet returned to his house and taught Khadija what he had learned and they prayed together. And so it was. The religion was now established on the basis of the ritual purification and prayer. Khadija was the first human to embrace it. After her was the Prophet's cousin Ali and Zaid, his adopted son, to whom he was looking after and the Prophet's best friend Abu Bakr. Those were the first people to accept Islam. Some of the earlier responses to the Prophet's call to Islam were not at all ascribed to any human attempt to persuade, as they simply believed in it. As the Quran began to, set, to be sent down more copiously, it was immediately transmitted by the Prophet to those who were with him. Then he, it was passed mouth to mouth, memorized and recited, and later on written down. The Quran was becoming a revelation, a book that spoke of the nature of all earthly things, of death and of certainty of the re resurrection, and the last judgment, followed by either hell or paradise. And the last judgment, it, this is all dependent on what the person does in this world. The glory of Allah, His indivisible oneness, His truth, wisdom, mercy and power, the marvels of nature and to their harmonious working together, which testifies to the oneness of their soul originator. Harmony is the imprint of oneness, which is so apparent in nature. From the self-awareness to the comfort to the fact that you will be meeting your Creator, to the greeting of peace, assalamu alaikum, peace be on you, between the believers, to the glorification of Allah in prayers and mentioning of his name before reading, eating or sleeping. The Quran became a guide, a way of life for the Muslims, and so did the example and the actions of the Prophet. As the revelation grew solid and, and big, so its followers did. The Prophet started inviting his family and clan to Islam. Some accepted it and some reacted not very well to it. Some didn't even want to hear it. He had a difficult journey ahead of him. The companions of the Prophet would often go out together in groups to the glens outside Mecca, where they could worship peacefully, because they were harassed and beaten as they did so. Finally, they, finally one day they, they were able to do that. As they were praying, some, rudely, some people rudely interrupted them with ridicule. Finally, they came to blows, and one of the companions of the Prophet hit one of them with the jawbone of a camel and wounded him. So this was the first bloodshed in Islam. But after that, they decided to refrain from violence until Allah decides otherwise. For the Quran continuously enjoyed patience upon the Prophet and the Muslims. As Allah says in the Quran, bear with patience what they say and part from them with a courteous farewell. This case of violence had been something of an exception on both sides, for the Quraysh were known only for their violent talk and not actions. Even after the Prophet had openly proclaimed it, the message, until they saw that it was direct, directed against their idols, their principles and practices, 
Some of them even went to their uncle, to the prophet, to tell him to make his nephew stop the stalk, otherwise they will desist them and they will fight them. So he did. The, his uncle spoke to him and told him all about that. The prophet's reply to, to the Quraysh's advice and threats was brave and profound. He said to them, I swear by Allah, if they put the sun in my right hand and the moon in my left hand, on condition that I abandon this horse before he has made it victorious, or I have perished therein, I would not abandon it. Then with tears in his eyes, the prophet rose and turned to go, but his uncle called him back, saying, Son of my brother, go you and say whatever you want, for by Allah, I will never forsake you on any account. The Quraysh task was set. They knew they wouldn't attack the prophet directly, as he had the protection of his uncle, whom at the time was one of the chief men of the Quraysh. So their plans kept on going and they saw this new religion as a big threat. They went on accusing the Prophet of being a magician and that he is to be avoided at all times. They even went as far as warning people before even entering Mecca, encircling all the roads to Mecca, waiting at every road lo loading to the, leading to the city, warning the people and scaring them. Was not Prophet Muhammad before he had begun preaching, one of the best loved men in Mecca? Was he not the one they celebrated upon his arrival? His tongue had not lost any of its eloquence, nor his character any of his nobility. However, even with the plans of the Quraysh to ruin the reputation of the Prophet, many people from the surrounding cities came to Islam by simply meeting the Prophet and speaking to him. Many of the Muslims were beaten up at the time and tortured because of their acceptance of Islam, but that did not stop them at all. Let's move further in time, as there is, a, as there is an incident which is worthy of mention. As we already mentioned, with the increase of the Muslims, there was an increase in the violence against them. One of the most ruthless and stern opponents of Islam and the Prophet was a man called Abu Jahl, which, translate, which was his nickname, which translates to the father of ignorance. He would insult the Prophet with every chance he could take, and one day he saw just this chance. He saw the Prophet walking, sitting in front of the mosque, and he came up to him, standing in front of him, and he proceeded to revile him with all the abuse he could utter. The Prophet just looked at him, but spoke no word, and he sadly rose to his feet and returned to his home. As the incident reached around Mecca, it reached one of his cousins, Hamza, who was not a Muslim yet, but he loved the Prophet dearly, and with anger and fury, he said to find Abu Jahl. When he found him, he actually said to him, Will you insult him now that I am also of his religion? And now that I avouch what he avouched? Strike me blow for blow if you can. This incident shows the, the patience and noble character of the Prophet and also shows the acceptance of Islam of the people around him through various ways. It was mostly the poor and the slaves entering Islam at the beginning of the revelation. One man worth mentioning is Bilal. He was an Abyssinian slave who heard about Islam and accepted it and was steadfast in it like no other man. Bilal went through a huge amount of persecution and through them all he would only say, Ahadun Ahad, one God, one God. The Prophet honored Bilal by using the same phrase in the first battle of the Muslims at Badr. Another lady by the name of Sumeya was killed brutally in Mecca, was being forced to accept her old religion back. As she refused, she had a spear forced through her body. She was the first martyr of Islam, dying in that process. She gave up her life for Islam. She was killed because she believed in one God only and followed the Prophet. What made those men and women sacrifice so much for Islam? They sacrificed their homes, families, wealth and lives. They loved the Prophet more than their own selves. And so did the Prophet love them and honor them and respect them like his own family. Islam brought their hearts together through guidance and the Quran. The Quran also strengthened their faith with its miracles and the comfort of meeting their Lord and having their final abode in paradise. They had the best teacher who wouldn't even be recognized as such. Whenever he was seen speaking to people, he would, sat be he would sit between them. He would never ever sit on a throne and he would never dress inappropriately. He was the most noble in speech. 
he treated them all equally and gave to the poor amongst them. He taught them that wealth and status are not worthy of mention and are not at all materialistic things, but they are your attitude, your faith, your righteousness, and your love for other people. I mean, is there any leader like this today? Are not our so-called leaders even today in India the, the richest and the most corrupt of people? If he lived today, there won't be any poverty and misuse of wealth. And he only lived 1,400 years ago. That is not a long way back. I love him dearly. What I do to meet him, really. That is why I try my best to be like him and defend his honor. Not only me, but the rest of the billions of Muslims around the world. The conspiracy against the Prophet grew as the Quraysh and its leaders became increasingly violent. The Prophet had no choice but to emigrate, so he did. He immigrated to Medina, a city north of Mecca, not too far. There, he and his friend Abu Bakr were welcomed with warm greetings of peace as they entered the city. In Medina, the Prophet and later on, all those who emigrated with him, after him, enjoy the freedom of practice of Islam in the open and to have the support of the people there, well, the majority of the people, not all of them. There were powerful Jewish tribes there that really did not believe in his message, but he still made treaties with them, so one could not harm the other through violence or support of conspiracies. Later on, the Prophet and the Muslims fought their first battle, defeating the Quraysh of Mecca. This was the Battle of Badr. The Muslims eventually conquered Mecca some eight years later. When they did, the Prophet did not take revenge on anyone. He was, he was just trying to be respectful and did not harass anyone or kill anyone. But he forgave and treated them with respect. Many accepted Islam at that point. The, prophet, the prophethood lasted for 20, 23, 23 years, in which the, the, the whole of Arabia was shaken and changed. Islam brought many people together and distinguished the truth from the falsehood. A year before his death, Prophet Muhammad performed Hajj and he called the people to do likewise with him. Many people joined him from Medina and elsewhere and they performed Hajj together. He then gave what is known as his last speech at Arafah in which he affirmed the just rulings of Islam. He said, I'll quote the majority of what he said. O people, listen to my words, for I do not know if I will meet you again after this year. O people, your blood, your wealth, and your honor are sacred to you as the sanctity of this day of yours, in this month of yours, in this land of yours. Every practice of the time of ignorance is beneath my feet. He meant practice before Islam. And the blood feuds of the times of ignorance are cancelled. Fear Allah concerning women. For you have taken them on the security of Allah and have made their bodies lawful to you by the words of Allah. I have left you with something which you adhere to it, you will never go astray after I am gone. This is the book of Allah. If you were asked about me, what would you say? And the people answered, we would bear witness that you have conveyed the message. You fulfilled the trust and advised us sincerely. Then he pointed with his finger to the sky and then towards the people and said, O oh Allah, bear witness, O oh Allah, bear witness, O oh Allah, bear witness. And so Allah revealed to him the verse, This day I have perfected your religion for you, completed my favor upon you, and have chosen for you Islam as your religion. Throughout history, there has never been a better man than the Prophet Muhammad wasallam. Yet there is not a single picture drawn or a sculpture made of him because he knew he was a slave of Allah simply and the messenger of Allah. He did not want anyone worshipping him. Where can you find a ruler which came into this world with little wealth and left with little wealth? Allah honored him in the Quran with the verse, and did we not exalt your fame? People at the time wondered and thought that this exalt in fame would be only amongst the people of Mecca. Today, his name is the most common name in the world, Allahu Akbar. There is not a minute or an hour or a day where his name is not mentioned, whether it will be for prayers for the Adhan or simply in remembrance. This makes him the most beloved man in history, the most mentioned man in history. 
His name truly fulfilled its meaning, Muhammad, which means the praiseworthy. Michael Hart, a US author, author, wrote a book which is named The 100 Most Influential Persons That Ever Lived in History. After studying the lives of the leaders throughout history, in, in, indisputably, he placed Prophet Muhammad wasallam at number one in his book. There was a treaty called the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, where the Quraysh sent a man to the Prophet named Suhail ibn Amr as a negotiator. He was an international negotiator who had met many rulers, including the rulers of Persia, the rulers of the Byzantine Empire, and many leaders. And when he met Muhammad, he came back to the Quraysh and said the following to them, surprised. I visited the Roman Emperor, I visited the Persian Emperor, I visited the Najashi of Abyssinia, but I have never in my life seen a leader that is so loved and followed by his followers. Like him, Muhammad. I saw amazing things. Muhammad would be making wudu, which would be the ablution for prayer, and the companions would be rushing to collect the water gushing from his body. So he said, do whatever you want with him, you would never make these people give up their leader. Just imagine the love they, the love they had for him. I hope this talk has made you eager to know more about the Prophet Muhammad in Islam. And I hope you will make your own research after that short talk on your own. So I'm going to end with the Quranic verse. Say, here Allah is one, the all subsisting, the need, the all subsisting, he neither gives birth, nor is he given birth to, and there is no one like him. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Any proof that you stated that he's, uh, uh, they mention him in the acts of violence, but where is your proof for that, that there are actions of violence? Where is your proof that there's actions of violence in the name of Islam? Okay. Yeah. He's quoting me. Um, there's no such quotation from the Prophet that says kill innocent people. That's not in uh, in Islam. Um, even I can mention the laws of war that we have in Islam. We are not um, we are not ordered. We are not allowed to kill children, women, and the elderly. We also are not allowed to destroy plants, trees nature. We are only allowed to fight those who fight us. So that's what Islam teaches. It doesn't teach any violence and, you know, there's only violence when we are being attacked. So, you know, tooth for tooth, cheek for cheek, head for head. That's the, the principle we follow. But we never, we, that this what you're seeing on the news is not the truth. So that's all I can say. There's no proof in it in the Quran and not in the, the sayings of the Prophet. You can see for yourself, find one word or one sentence where the Prophet says that, and then you can make your proof. But there's no such thing. So, you can... Woman's? Yeah. Okay. 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 And there are other institutions that are not the society to describe them. Okay. 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 Uh, well, I can tell you the first university for women in the world was in Morocco, which was based by a Muslim man. So that's one proof. Then what I what what I can tell you that the Prophet's wife, one of his wives was one of the biggest scholars of her time and still today. She narrated many, many a hadith from him and her name was Aisha. And she was, she was a woman, she used to wear the veil, just like you see, but she was not oppressed because she was more knowledgeable than maybe me and everyone here in the room. She was given the chance to learn, to practice and to even teach other people, including men. So there's no such thing as oppression in Islam, except those that are doing it are ignorant maybe, or they don't know what they're doing. Then in that case, that's their mistake. But when it comes to Islam, there's no such thing in our religion. The women are actually diamonds. We are protected, you know? We are not, the, our husbands are not allowed to beat us. They're not allowed to mistreat us. They are not even allowed to raise their voice over us in some cases. In case there is a reason, obviously. 
in Islam we believe that the woman and wife, the woman and husband are garments. So the man should cover the woman and the woman should cover the man. Meaning we should protect one another and should, we should balance one another because man and woman are different. The man is the protector and the woman is the caretaker. So we should balance and that's how Allah has taught us. Balance, respect and love each other. You know, there's no such thing as you said oppression in Islam. Which one? No, that's not the correct translation. The correct translation is men are the protectors of women. Protectors. Kabam. Which means, Munilabba, you can add. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Protect. Yeah. 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 That's what I've read also. But yeah. A caretaker. Yeah. Which is very good actually, right? Because today some women are forced to work. You know, husbands are sitting. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. That's true. Also, women are allowed to work. I don't know if you know that. Women in Islam, we are allowed to work. So we can work if you want. But um, also the amazing thing about our religion is whatever I earn, I am not obliged to give to my husband. It is my money. So I can keep it if I want, which is kind of amazing. I don't have to give it unless I want to give it. And if I give it, it is as charity. So it's a good good uh, reward on me. So it's a blessing. Uh, my question is that I haven't read this book, but in many places I have read about biography of Muhammad. And uh, I've read the, the construction of Mecca, and all how Abraham had uh, constructed the Kaaba, how uh, there were 360 something tribes or gods there, and after when uh, Muhammad came, he had to establish Islam there, and he uh, something like deconstructed or destroyed other temples or other worship places and constructed Mecca there as there. So, uh, and also about the Sharia, Sharia law, how it established as the rule or code for Islamic traditions. And in many places I have seen a comparison to uh, Prophet, Prophet Muhammad to Constantine, the Roman Empire, Emperor Constantine, and how he had a part in creating the New Testament for Christ. What's your take on that? Because in both cases we could see a bit similarities as far as I could observe. So what's your take on that? Because here in this book I didn't see if you're telling about the, oh, the, the miracles and the speech of the And Lord. also how uh, in order, the, of course, shared a flow to New Testament yes. and how both had a part in constructing the so-called worship of Islam or Christianity. The similarity. So what's, yeah, similarity. what's your take on such a such case view? Um, well, Allah says in the Quran that He was the one that sent all the revelation before us. Um, so it makes sense that when He sends a new one, it will have the same message as the last one. Do you understand what I mean? The message would fall through. Otherwise, if Allah says, worship Jesus Christ, and then He says, worship me only, that doesn't make sense, right? So what happened is, because when He, he revealed the book, the gospel, let's say, to Jesus, alayhi salam, People changed it. And he actually says that in the Quran. Allah says that in the Quran. People have bought this world for the hereafter. And they change with their own hands the writing of Allah. Which means that the, those people, the Romans, or I don't know who it was after Jesus, they actually changed and sat and changed the book. Do you understand? So Allah had to send another one to confirm the truth again. Otherwise the people would be following falsehood. So that was the blessing of Allah in a way. He sent the Qur'an and he has promised not to destroy it and to leave it until the day of resurrection. Yeah. 
Christianity. Then many of the things I hear in a parallel and reading on something is Muhammad because he also prayed somewhat same. I don't know how to say it like same, but still a bit of similarity you would find in both their okay. act maybe in principle okay. such a okay. or, or such a view okay. uh, following the God. Okay. okay. So what's your take on that? Is there a parallel? Well, as far as I can tell, um, my knowledge is not very uh, huge on that, but what I've read is I know that the Byzantine Empire, which Constantinople ruled after, uh, was a very brutal empire where people were, um, there was castes from what I know. There was poor and rich and the slaves were treated very badly. Uh, Constantinople lived very, very lavishly. He had castles, he had women, he had clothes. Um, in comparison with Muhammad, a prophet, um, he never wore extravagant clothes. He was actually seen wearing the simplest of clothes. He never had any wealth, any castles. He slept on the floor. You know, he didn't have a bed. Um, he rode on a donkey and a camel and a horse. Um, he never had anyone carrying him. He doesn't, he didn't have a throne. Um, he spent his wealth for helping others and providing for his family. And actually it is said that he never used to buy anything except um, one year of food. So he would buy what he needs and sometimes he would give it away and sometimes he won't even eat for some days so he could give to the poor. So the comparison is not there because there was completely two different men. Muhammad preached oneness of God and Constantinople preached Trinity, which means... Yeah. Okay. Um, Constantinople actually didn't construct a belief in one God. What he did is he divided God in three. He made Jesus, the Son of God, the Spirit, which is Angel Gabriel, and then God. So what he actually did is... Um, there was a meeting in time in the early 1900s, I forgot the year exactly, you can check that on YouTube, um, where he actually got all the scholarly figures in Istanbul at the time, and he told them, present to me the best version of the Bible that you have. Uh, but Constantinople at the time was a, a sun worshipper, so he used to worship the sun. Yeah. So he wanted a religion that could match with his so that he can make a book that will, you know, he could actually advertise his own religion and another religion at the same time, you know. So what he did is he chose a book or he chose a man by the name of Paul. St. Paul, have you heard of him? He came with the idea of the Trinity and he said to him, let's make God three. Okay. And if, I don't know if you've been into a church in Kerala, but I have visited many churches before. You can see on, on the walls paintings of the saints and behind them there's a bright sun. Do you understand? So what they've done is he actually made the worshipping of Jesus and God and Gabriel the worship of sun. So he, he actually demolished the oneness and he made the trinity. Yeah. And Muhammad on the other hand did the, the other thing. He abolished thousands of gods sun worshipping, moon worshipping, whatever it was, even man worshipping. And he said, there's only one God, pray to him and you'll be okay. Follow me, pray to him and you'll be okay. That's what he said. Simple, no delusions, no lies, no sculptures, no paintings, nothing. Just one. Um, can I ask you a question? Um, before, uh, let's say, you had this short introduction to the book, it was very short, uh, did you know anything about Muhammad? I mean, honestly, did you, have you ever read anything on him except watching Asianet or Kerala Satellite or reading the newspaper? Have you read any books on him? Yes, no? If, if yes, then you can raise your hand. If no, then you can leave your hand. Okay. One? Anyone else?
<laughs> so you can. Good afternoon to all. It is my privilege to have been asked to propose a vote of thanks to this occasion. I, on behalf of the English Department of Government College Malpuram, and on my own behalf, extend a very heartfelt thanks to our Chief Guest, Mrs. Uh, Dimitria Sudaiva, for gracing this for gracing this uh, for gracing this occasion uh, with your presence and sharing your uh, findings and feelings, uh, opinions and perspectives about the book, Muhammad. Thank you, ma'am. Then I express my special thanks to Vilat sir for organizing this function. This function. Then I extend my thanks to each and everyone uh, together here and especially to the teachers. Thank you.